For the past 13 years, Dr. Armin Feldman has provided pre-trial, pre-litigation medical consulting to our legal system. He has trained over 1,600 physicians around the United States to learn how to do this kind of medical consulting and supplement their income by providing these services. Dr. Feldman consults on those 9 out of 10 cases that are settled and never go to trial. It sounds like expert witness work, but it isn't. We discuss what makes medical legal consultant work different from a medical expert. Essentially, you're working for the plaintiff's attorney in a personal injury or workman's comp case, usually because of some type of traumatic injury, trying to determine if the case has merit, reviewing the case for concurrent adverse outcomes that may not have been identified, like depression, and assisting the attorney until the case goes to trial, when an expert witness would take over. That being said, most cases settle. We discuss how to get a foot in the door, how to market yourself, and how much time you should expect this to occupy. He has an upcoming conference at the end of April, virtual, of course, that you can find at medlegal2021.com. Dr. Feldman began his career in psychiatry, practicing for over 20 years and owning several outpatient head injury rehabilitation clinics, which I guess gave him his initial contacts into that industry. In 2008, Dr. Feldman opened MD Consulting Services, aiding legal professionals in navigating the medical issues in their cases. In 2011, Dr. Feldman expanded his services, creating MD Business Consultants, a coaching program and business system for physicians doing medical legal consulting. With a database of 750,000 thousand physicians, Dr. Feldman teaches his techniques via his coaching program and through a conference via live stream only due to the current pandemic. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Before we get into the show, here's a quick message from MR Insurance, a small business that helps physicians with their disability insurance needs. Michael L. Relvis is a CFP professional and insurance agent committed to helping physicians nationwide with their term life and disability insurance needs. He provides an objective, transparent, and education-focused process that aims to help physicians make prudent decisions and avoid overcomplicating things. He exclusively offers own occupation disability insurance policies for residents, fellows, and attending physicians. We know he'd be happy to help you with whatever your needs are. You can find Michael at drpodcastnetwork.com slash mrinsurance or contact him at 800-817-4500. Two, two. Dr. Armin Feldman, thanks so much for being on the podcast. It's a pleasure to be here, Brad. Thanks for having me. So what's the difference between a medical legal consultant and a medical expert? Because all of my exposure up until now, and, and it's not like I've done significant expert work, but mm-hmm. is that when attorneys are, are going to try a case or considering trying a case, they look for a medical expert. So what you're going to discuss today, it sounds like it's a kind of related, but yet completely separate field or, or phenomenon or, or yeah, whatever, identity right. that they, they're looking for. So what's a medical legal expert and how is it different? Sure. So uh, for um, forever, maybe for centuries, Brad, there, there have been physicians that act as medical experts in their field, but there were not physicians acting as medical legal consultants until I uh, started doing this work a little over 13 years ago. Just by way of background, I'm trained as a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, although somebody asked me now what my specialty is. I've been doing this 13 years and really started a new subspecialty of forensic medicine. So if somebody asked me now my specialty, I'll say it's uh, forensic uh, medicine. But my area of specialty uh, turned out to be mild traumatic brain injury. And I wound up owning outpatient head injury rehabilitation clinics around the country, which I was fortunate enough to uh, eventually sell. And in that role, you know, I've testified as an expert witness really more times than I want to remember on behalf of my patients who are either being cut off of their medical care or offered some pittance of a settlement. And after I sold those clinics, I was thinking, well, what do you want to do next? And I thought, well, maybe what I could do is just answer any kind 
of medical question that comes up in a case. And not only did that turn out to be a good thing and fill a niche, but uh, over time that really developed into a, a whole separate branch of forensic medicine. So obviously when doctors and lawyers think about lawyers hiring doctors, they really only think of one thing and that's hiring physicians to be medical experts primarily at trial, right? So um, as a- not necessarily. I sorry, but but not at trial because you need leading up to the trial, right? Sure, you need sure. someone to review the case, then you mm. need to they need to be deposed. And then it's really only in a small minority of cases where you do end up going to trial. So I, I think mm -hmm. to say that they're being hired to go to trial is isn't necessarily the case. They're, they're being hired for the entirety of it from stem to stern. Sure, sure. I understand that uh, only a small number actually wind up at trial. But if a medical expert's going to be involved, the attorney has filed the case. Uh, and uh, the filing of the case not only may lead to the trial, but it's also a uh, message to the other side that they're willing to go to trial. So, of course, they'll ask the medical expert their opinions in their field, uh, and they may be deposed by opposing counsel, and they may often end up as a retained medical expert at trial, along with treating doctors, will be a treating expert at trial. So, sure, th that's the case. But in the areas of the law in which I consult, which uh, primarily are personal injury cases and workers' compensation cases, approximately nine out of 10 of those cases settle. And that's where we come in as medical legal consultants. First of all, I'll answer any medical question in a case. And uh, a medical legal consultant, at the bottom line, what we're always doing is we're helping the attorney to better negotiate and settle the case for better value with less attorney time. We're helping the attorney get the appropriate medical uh, care for their clients, and we're helping the attorney to negotiate the medical issues in the case. And so we're looking at all of the medical aspects of the case. There are actually a little over 16 different specific services that I offer uh, PI and workers' comp attorneys that help them in specific ways to better negotiate and settle the case. Now, obviously, in that one out of 10 case that uh, doesn't get settled and the attorney is going to have to do depositions and potentially go to trial, then they're going to need medical experts in every area of injury. But for the purpose of negotiating and settling the case, what the attorney needs are well thought out, well reasoned medical opinions, reports, and other services uh, that will bring them to uh, a better settlement. So right now, I know a lot of physicians who don't take workman's comp because it's a lot of onerous paperwork and very little compensation, ultimately, mm -hmm. for all the work that you put in. So what you're saying is now it's similar paperwork, but now you can command significantly more compensation just because you're not mm -hmm. you're not the treating physician, but you are the medical expert. So there are like there are bigger pockets here. Right. So uh, first thing I should say is a physician in any specialty can learn and be trained to do this kind of consulting. Um, and so um, the paperwork that I would do as a medical consultant is completely different than what a treating doctor would do uh, treating a workers' compensation case. So l let me give you just a, a, a kind of a broad example. Now, of course, this doesn't happen to me anymore because all the physicians in uh, Colorado know who I am. But when I first started, let's say I was hired by the attorney because they're trying to negotiate out uh, something related to a rotator cuff injury in the case, right? And they asked me to write a report that's specific to the issue that they're trying to negotiate. And I write a report and uh, my reports, uh, my, the attorney that hired me will give that report to opposing counsel. Well, what's opposing counsel going to do? The first thing they're going to do is they're going to look me up. And in the beginning, they would come back to the attorney that hired me 
and say, well, why should we pay attention to what Dr. Feldman has to say? He's not an expert in rotator cuffs. And what the attorney that hires me will say is, well, Dr. Feldman acts as a medical consultant for me in all my cases. And I can tell you, if we can't get this specific issue negotiated uh, in a settlement and force me to take this case to trial, when I hire my retained expert, my retained expert at deposition and trial is going to say exactly what Dr. Feldman said in his uh, report. In fact, they would both be relying on the same literature. So let's get this case set. But how do you get to that place without having that specialty, right? Like you find you have a reputation now in Colorado because you've mm-hmm. been doing it for so long. They, they, right. sides of the council know who you are, but like mm-hmm. me as an otolaryngologist, if, if I start reviewing rotator cuff cases and I say one thing and their opposing counsel from the hospital for special surgery down the street from me, who's like written seven book chapters on rotator cuff injuries. Like, I, you know, how are they, how is my mm-hmm. argument going to end up Right. Well, first of all, uh, the likelihood of opposing counsel hiring a medical expert during the negotiation process process is actually uh, not that is is slim. Okay. So, and again, we're separating this from medical malpractice, right? We're not yeah, talking I never, about. Medical I never work in medical malpractice cases. This is workman's comp. This is personal injury, but not personal injury. Um, medical malpractice. It's just, yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. It, it's the patient had a, so, uh, had an injury of some sort, either at work or not. And mm-hmm. now they're suffering because of it. And so you're trying to get, you know, a settlement either from in, insur- an insurance company, basically from an insurance company. Is there anyone right. else who ends up being no. the opposing? It's always an insurance company. Right. I mean, if there was a slip and fall on someone's property, then you've got you know, and, and workman's comp, you know, it's the place to work. There are people. It's not just this big, faceless, nameless insurance company. But ultimately, if they've got an umbrella policy or something, you're, you're not dealing with the individual that much. You're dealing with the insurance company. I'm never dealing with the individual. Yeah. First of all, all of my clients are attorneys. So I'm not dealing with the client of the attorney. But uh, let me give you another example. So one of the things that I do, and I may have been the first physician in the country to do this, is um, I actually physically sit in and observe independent medical exam done by other physicians. And, you know, for years, there have been physicians hired by insurance companies to do independent medical exams. And, And they're very good doctors that do very good IMEs. We also know that uh, in every community across the country, there's a group of doctors that make either all of their income or most of their income doing IMEs. And these doctors are under tremendous secondary gain pressure. The fact is, if they don't consistently come down with opinions that favor the insurance position, the insurance companies will find doctors that do. So let's say the issue is related to a rotator cuff uh, and uh, the opposing counsel says, well, we would like to get an independent medical exam regarding this issue. And uh, the attorney that hires me would say, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to have Dr. Feldman sit in and observe this IME, uh, which I do. And I uh, you know, often take copious notes when I do that. Then the IME report comes back and the IME doctor says, well, an arthrogram, uh, there was no dye leakage. So I think the uh, person's fine. You know, there there, there are no problems. Then I'm in a position now to write an IME rebuttal report where I can say, well, if if you look at the literature, it's not a matter of just uh, whether there's dye leakage or not, that you have to look at the degree of pain the person has, the degree uh, of range of motion the person has, what kind of functionality that they have. And uh, almost any uh, orthopedic surgeon would consider these things beyond whether there's dye leakage as to whether or not that this uh, uh, client has recovered from their uh, rotator cuff injury. And on that the being basis- said, there is there is a conflict of interest on both sides, right? There's a group. There's no. if you're, but but uh, you know, if you're expecting to get rehired mm-hmm. for the plaintiff's counsel, mm-hmm. don't you have to deliver? Right? Aren't they no, going to expect no, you? No. To- so one of the great things, and, you know, I'm often asked. There's another way to ask your question. In other words, aren't you just a hired gun? And one of the great things about being on this side of the fence, 
that is working for plaintiff and claimant attorneys, is that these attorneys want and value uh, our straight up medical opinions. In fact, these attorneys don't want to be carrying loser cases with their time and with their money. So if I tell the attorney, look, you don't have a case here for whatever the reason, uh, the person's malingering. They're primarily driven by secondary gain. There's a pre-existing condition, whatever it is. The attorneys want to hear that opinion from me. And what they'll do is just try, try to settle that case as quickly as they can for whatever they can get. So I never face the kind of secondary gain issues that other doctors might face. Interesting. Interesting. I mean, that's that's a lot of the reason that I hear from other physicians that they don't want to do medical expert witness work. Or, or something similar to this, right? You don't want to throw your colleagues under the bus. You don't want to, you know, turn into someone who's, like you said, a hired gun who's just offering medical right. expert opinions because the lawyers always, they rely on you to uh, to, to bend mm-hmm. the truth, right? The, so yeah. so it's it's nice to hear that they, that, you know that that they're they're hiring you because they want to know what's actually going on because they don't right. want it's not in their financial best interest because I mean Nobody's we've talked about interest. this we've talked about this in, in in a previous episode and um they're gamblers they're gamblers and so they want to stack the deck in their favor as much as possible and if they have someone who they think is is malingering uh, or that that you think is malingering clearly they're not holding the hand that they thought they were. And so the sooner you tell them that they're not holding the strong hand that they thought they had, then they're going to try and, you know, they're going to fold or they're going to, you know, whatever the, whatever the poker analogy ends up going to is they want to know sooner rather than later, because it's not in their, it's not in their favor. Yeah. They're hiring me as a consultant on that medical consultant on their team to do the best, very best job I can do for them. And sometimes the very best job I can do for them is to say, look, you don't have a case. Yeah. So uh, there's none of that secondary gain uh, problem that other uh, physicians uh, may face. So if we want to start dipping our toes in this water, where do we start? Let's say we're not in Colorado, right? We're in Arkansas, New York, Washington, Arizona, somewhere, somewhere. I just named all coastal places, maybe, I should, or except for Arkansas. Okay. So where, you know, where, where do we begin? Right. Well, there are a couple, as I said, um, uh, I think I was the first physician in the country to start doing this. And so um, I've been training other physicians how to do this work over the course of the past 11 years. And um, unless someone has been trained by me, uh, I, I don't think there are other physicians doing this kind of work unless they've been through this training. Um, I've had the... Uh, well, then uh, how are these cases happening? You know, it, it seems to me that they that the, the system has been in place. So these cases are happening. Somebody's acting as an expert in these cases right now. How they're we... acting as experts, right, but they're not right. acting as medical consultants. So you'd be surprised, perhaps, to learn that the in cases that are being settled, most of the time the attorney isn't relying on uh, – they may be relying on treating doctors, but they're not relying on retained experts. Okay, uh, so you're, there's, there's a third – so you're a third party. Right now they're just relying on the treating physician's opinions and using that, whereas you're a third party that's reviewing the case. Yeah, I'm a, a consultant to the attorney on all the medical aspects of the case. Okay, so when you're or someone you've trained is not involved, that the way that the system's worked up until now is they've just been relying on the treating physician's opinions. They've right. just been sequestering records, reviewing records, and rendering their own opinion, not hiring a third-party physician to render another opinion. Yeah, that's that's correct. Okay. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Um, so then it sounds like that costs them extra money, right? Because uh, they're gonna have to they're gonna have to pay us for this. So yeah, how sure. do we in a, in a in a place in a city that say doesn't have the experience that where you are or one of your trainees is? Mm-hmm. How do we convince them to hire us? Yeah, I don't really try to convince them at all. So um, one of the things that I uh, train physicians uh, in is not only the medicine that they need to know, but also uh, on the business end. So when you you have to go seek out 
uh, personal injury and workers' comp attorneys that work on the claimant side. And uh, you have to meet with them, educate them, uh, help them to understand how you can help them, their clients in the case. And then what will happen is that some of the attorneys will say, well, I've never heard of a doctor doing this. It's not how I do things. I don't want to start now. But many of the attorneys, really, if not most, they get it. They understand how these services will be of help and value to them, their clients in the case. And they're certainly willing to try you out on one case. Yeah. And I, I can tell you that uh, my experience and the experience of other physicians around the country doing this is, in fact... Uh, attorneys that do use medical legal consultants are settling their cases for better value with less attorney time and getting the appropriate medical care for their clients and better negotiating all the medical issues in the case. So it's, it's, of course, it doesn't happen in every case, but it's rare that uh, an attorney who uses a medical legal consultant doesn't uh, see uh, the value. Most of the time, it's a financial value, but also other value that they that it brings to the case. Well, it seems even even without settling for more, you could just do the math, uh, Mr. Attorney. How much do you bill an hour? How long would it take you to go through these st- this stack of records to figure out mm-hmm. what's going on? Six hours? Okay, I can do it in two, and I want to, you know, this percent. Do the math, and you've already saved them money, right? Because yeah. they bill out a certain amount of hour, you bill out a certain amount, and you can certainly do it much more efficiently than them. Give them a good summary. Tell them if they have, have a case or not. It, it, that sounds like a pretty mm-hmm. convincing way to sell them, unless the physician, of course, is, is saying, as you were saying, uh, I've been doing it this way for years, and I'm going to continue doing it. Right. Well, thank you for your time. I would want to say something on one of the things you said. So uh, um, helping attorneys to decide whether they have a case or not makes up a very small percentage of what I do. Attorneys who do personal injury work and workers' compensation work, they're very, very good at knowing whether they have a case or not. And sometimes I'm asked to help them with that. But uh, the things that I'm more typically asked to help them with doesn't have to do with having them uh, help them to decide if they have a case. So what is it? So the service that I perform that's the most requested is to provide the attorney with um, a comprehensive medical summary report that encompasses the entire case, all the injuries in the case, in which I um, render uh, my medical opinion, sometimes uh, with diagnoses that uh, aren't in the medical records, actually, but I, uh, you can see from, uh, process, you know, from going through the case, and will include my medical opinions with regard to the ongoing medical problems, causation, mechanism of action, functional losses, future medical care and costs, uh, and uh, a variety of things. And what attorneys are doing with these reports, now they can use them for what they call the medical case coordination, but far and away, attorneys are using these reports to include in their settlement demand letters. And uh, the consistent (laughs) feedback that I've gotten, other physicians have gotten through the years, is that by including these medical summary reports as part of their settlement demand letters, they're settling cases uh, for better value. So it sounds like you're not just providing a service for the attorney, you're providing a service to the patient because you're well, reviewing think- their record and and it's and you said you're identifying diagnoses that, that weren't readily apparent. Uh, so you might even be bringing them to the attention of the patient. Yeah, first of all, uh, they're not a patient of mine. They're they're a client of the attorney. But one of the great things about doing this kind of work is that you are helping injured individuals in a way that they weren't previously able to get this kind of uh, medical help. Help them in identifying what the actual injuries of the case are, what tr- uh, what the uh, treatments, uh, what treatments should be included in the settlement, and uh, helping them to work through the the medical problems and the treatment for the case. So, um, you know, what I like to say, I always work on the side of the little guy going up against the insurance companies, often their own insurance company denying legitimate claims. So uh, although my client in every case is the attorney, what's really gratifying and rewarding about this work is it's a non-clinical consulting field in which you really get to help people. So, where do we find the types of attorneys? If we want to dip our toes in this, do we, mm-hmm. if we want to decide if we even want to begin to do it, if this is our speed, mm-hmm. do we, 
is there like a website where we can meet attorneys looking for this? Like the, like the seek website, S E A K not, not right. No, no. Um, You uh, would have to go to individual attorneys and explain to them what it is that you do and why it's valuable to them. How do we know which attorneys? How do we know which attorneys do this type of work? You're looking for personal injury uh, attorneys and attorneys that uh, work on the claimant side in workers' compensation cases. Got it. Okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, is is there any limit to who we can work with? Like, does it matter state to state? Do we need any type of uh, malpractice insurance to, to do this? Right. So every one of these medical legal consulting businesses is a local business. But by the nature of the business, by the nature of the marketing for the business, it's Im- probably impractical. But there's such a demand in every area of the country for these kinds of services. You'll just be soliciting business in your local area. With regard to the question of whether you need medical malpractice uh, to do this, it's a good question. And there are a couple of answers to that question. First of all, here's the bottom line answer. Uh, If you are concerned about this, what I uh, always uh, recommend is that Hire an attorney in your state, probably only take the person a couple hours of their time and have them give you a written opinion as to whether or not you need medical malpractice to do that. Now, um, I'm not an attorney, so I'll preface that, but what I'm going to say next with that, but I don't think you need medical malpractice for this purpose. I don't carry it for this purpose. I've uh, done a little over 3,000 cases. All of my clients are attorneys. They certainly know how to sue people. Never say never, right? But uh, you know, so far, I've never come close to a sniff of anyone threatening to sue me. I think I do a good job, but of course you could get sued anyway. But what I'm really being hired to do is render medical opinion. So if you render that medical opinion in good faith, you talk to the attorney, you you read the medical records, you interview the client of the attorney, you do the appropriate medical research, you produce a cogent uh, report that's useful. Um, It's very hard to sue someone, even if if they didn't like your opinion, which I'm not sure that's ever happened. But um, but, um, and you render that opinion in good faith, it's tough to get sued for that purpose. Well, you might need some type of insurance for your business, but it wouldn't be medical malpractice because as you made the distinction earlier, you said it's not my patient. It's Mm -hmm. my client's client. Like I'm the client of the lawyer and this is my lawyer's client. So there's no doctor-patient relationship. You're not treating, you're just reviewing something for the lawyer. So if anything, it wouldn't be medical malpractice. It would just be... I guess right. some type of other legal. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, that's a good point. And I, what I do recommend to everyone uh, that does this and people that train with me is I do recommend that you get errors and omissions insurance that any kind of consultant to the legal system would get, whether you're a police officer, a structural engineer, a nurse, a physician. Uh, and that insurance runs somewhere between five and $1,500 a year, depending on what state you're in. So you... As you mentioned earlier, you you train people for this. Yes. So how many people have you trained for this? A little over 1,600. You've trained, you've done 3,000 cases, you've trained 1,600 people. Yeah. Wow. Physicians. Mm -hmm. Physicians, wow. Yeah, in Um, the last 11 years. And and so um, how do you go about doing that? What does that look like? Yeah, so there are two ways to get the training. Um, One way is... Uh, every year, I do a two-day uh, conference, which is really a crash course in how to do this. Uh, and uh, in fact, I have my next uh, conference coming up April 24th and 25th. Uh, it is by live stream only. Yes, uh, I would hope. <laughs> yeah. Uh, last year, uh, well, for the last two years, but last year we turned uh, our living room into a temporary TV studio. We'll do that again this year. And uh, one of the very first things that I say at the conference is when you leave this conference, you will have all of the tools and training that you need on both the business side and the medical side to go home and successfully do that. So uh, that's one way to get the training. The other way is I do have a one-year remote training program, medical legal consulting coaching program, uh, that obviously is um, uh, more intense. Uh, I can deliver 
tools that actually are impractical to give out at a conference. And maybe one of the biggest differences is one of the things in the coaching program is you get a year of coaching with me. And of course, it's not an absolute necessity. There are plenty of physicians that come to the conference and are very successful doing this. But physicians that stay in close touch with me tend to, to do well. And the other way to get the training is through the remote training program. What are the most common injuries that you're seeing? So uh, there's a whole slew of them, but headaches, fractures, soft tissue injuries, orthopedic injuries, rotator cuff injuries, uh, sprains, strains, mild traumatic brain injury, depression. Believe it or not, complex regional pain syndrome is fairly is something common that I see. But uh, those would be some of the common things. So these are these are traumatic injuries. Trauma, all traumatic injuries. They're yeah, all whether, traumatic injuries. Okay. Whether it's work-related or uh, in some personal injury case. So obviously in a personal injury case, first of all, there has to be negligence, right? So there's an, a negligent act. Somebody goes through a, a red light and they broadside a car. Well, and then the person in the car gets injured uh, due to the negligence of the person that hit them. Typically what happens is they'll uh, have some injuries. They'll start trying to get treated for the, those injuries. They're dealing with their insurance company to pay for that treatment. And oftentimes things don't go well. They'll hire an attorney. Uh, and that's where, where I come in. I'm hired by the attorney to be on the attorney's team to work towards uh, a successful settlement of the case. Interesting. And and just to reiterate what you said earlier, you don't have to be, because these, it sounds like the most appropriate people from my perspective to be the medical legal consultants would be people with experience in this. And that would also give them a foot in the door, right? The orthopedic surgeons, the physiatrists, the neurologists, because mm -hmm. a lot of them probably have, especially the orthopedic surgeons, you know, those, those doctors mm -hmm. have experience with the workman's comp attorneys. They have a relationship so they could even, you know, start that relationship and take it a step further. But again, make convince me why an otolaryngologist should be mm -hmm. in that arena. So Aside from facial I'm factors. very rarely, you know, I started off and the other physicians that do this were very rarely asked about our specialties. The attorneys are much more interested in knowing if my medical opinions, reports, and other services will help them through the settlement. So the, the biggest driver is some physicians just, by the way, I've trained plenty of otolaryngologists, but, and just about every other specialty you could possibly think of. But some physicians, they just like to stay in their lane. You know, I'm a pathologist. That's all I want to do. But if you like general, if you like medicine in general, if you love medicine, if you uh, have some intellectual curiosity, if you enjoy lifelong learning and you want to get into a non-clinical field where you're still really helping people, then this is for you. So as I may have said to you earlier, you know, I, I'm certainly in no position to do orthopedic or neurosurgery, but uh, I certainly put my uh, knowledge base of spine injuries, uh, lumbar and cervical uh, injuries, uh, rotator cuff injuries, a whole variety of other things that I've uh, had cases uh, that I've done and uh, had the opportunity to learn about these things, gotten paid by the attorneys to do that. Uh, that research. Uh, and I, I've learned a tremendous amount of medicine. Uh, for me, this work has actually been really fun. I'm certainly a better and more well-rounded doctor uh, than I was before I started doing this. And it's been a real pleasure to expand my knowledge base in medicine, as well as uh, helping people. Is this a viable exit strategy for those of us who are over it or done we're done. Mm. We don't want to practice anymore. We don't want to see another add-on on the schedule complaining that they're being made to wait, even though they got there late and they still haven't figured out their paperwork. And then we find out that they don't even have insurance anymore and we're tired of getting yelled at for it. Is right. this a viable exit strategy? Yes. Um, so there are physicians like me that do this full time. There are many physicians that do this instead of actually retiring. The largest group of physicians that do this do this as part of an existing practice. Uh, and uh, you can then 
It's certainly not an exact science, but first of all, what I tell physicians is you really need at a minimum about eight hours a week in order to do this justice and make it fly. If you don't have eight hours a week, don't do this. But typically what happens is that physicians may start at that amount or maybe a little bit more. They find that they really enjoy the work. It's quite lucrative. Um, and uh, they do get satisfaction out of helping the people that uh, the injured people uh, through the attorneys through which they work, and they build their time up. Now, what I said is not exact science, is that um, you can pretty much regulate your hours uh, based on the specific attorneys that are in your referral base. So, you know, this guy's going to refer uh, every case to you. This guy's going to refer a case a week. This, this woman may send you two cases a year. And it doesn't take very long to get a feel for the specific attorneys in your referral base for you to do approximately the number of hours a week that you wish to do. Fantastic. So again, to reiterate, people can find you at MedLegal 2021 for this coming April 24th, 25th conference. Uh, MedLegal2021.com. Yes. And uh, for the uh, coaching program, it's MD, short for medical doctor, biz, B-I-Z, short for business, MD, biz, con, short for consulting, MDBizCon.com. MD, MDBizCon.com. Of course, that'll all be in the show notes. Dr. Armin Feldman, any any parting uh, words for our guests on 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 why you became so passionate about this? Well, I, I think I've hit on. Thank you for yeah. asking me that question. But I think I've hit on this. Um, if you want to do some uh, um, really interesting, stimulating, um, satisfying, and meaningful in terms of helping people, uh, non clinical work. Uh, then uh, this is for you. By the way, I should tell you, you know, the entire uh, 13 years that I've been doing this, I've worked out of a home office. And uh, Which means uh, you can I deduct uh, have... some of that, right? <laughs> Say it again. Which means you can deduct some of that, right? Since oh, it's a home do office. I, I don't, I don't want to do that, but uh, too complicated. But if you want something that's uh, interesting, lucrative, helps people, is actually fun, uh, and um, obviously doesn't have some of the stress that clinical practice has, and I know what that's like, I did it, then this is something for you to consider. Great. Well, thank you very much for your time, and uh, we're all looking forward to the conference. Great. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it, Brett. Such a great show with Dr. Feldman. Before we end, don't forget to reach out to MR Insurance Consultants, where their goal is to assist physicians in obtaining the most comprehensive coverage available to fit their unique situation. Reach out for both excellent and quality service at drpodcastnetwork.com slash mrinsurance. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on The Physician's Guide to Doctoring.